Thank you. Um, and thanks for attending. I know it's a cold evening and we like to huddle down and get work done. So I appreciate your participation. Um, I think this screen is a little bit, okay. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'm here today to talk about um, operative landscapes. Um, and I guess really uh, the idea here, or I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of um, my general inspiration um, and sort of what, what, what drives me as a, a little bit of a foreground, um, talk a bit about the book, um, but then within that, talking about the framework of the book to also intersperse some of the works of North Design Office um, to sort of give you a sense of um, how um, what I look at in my research influences my practice. Um, so this quote by um, Anne Whiston Spurn um, uh, that talks about the yellow wood f um, uh, tree that flowered early and profusely. And so the idea that um, we may be able to look at this um, and so see the tree flowering and, and think about how beautiful it is, um, but not recognize that um, when trees go into um, profuse blossom or uh, eventually profuse seeding it's because they're they're actually stressed out and they're they're on their way out and they're trying to produce this last um, hurrah so that they can continue on their their genetic um, offspring um, and so her point um, with this here was that once a yellow would uh, stood no more and few know why um, is the idea that we've lost this language of landscape the ability to to read it um, and so uh, throughout her book um, uh, the language of landscape she's really promoting this idea of establishing frameworks um, to provide a structure um, where landscape um, can express um, natural and cultural processes of space. Um, and so this is, you know, a book that um, I guess is, I think the publication date is 89. So it's something that influenced me um, when I first started uh, in design. But I think it still, it, it holds still quite a bit of um, validity in terms of that idea of how um, legibility of landscape is important and how we can incorporate that into the urban condition. Um, so this is definitely something that um, I, I spend a lot of time uh, observing um, both my uh, partner in life and in practice, um, Pete North and I um, do uh, spend a lot of time outdoors and a lot of that time is sort of observing uh, the, the natural environment and positing um, why things change, uh, why that happens, um, why certain environments might grow the way they do, like the black oak um, savanna in High Park, um, or noticing uh, a sudden collection of aspens um, and, and thinking about um, locationally why they might have um, conglomerated. Um, even sort of very uh, temporal uh, changes um, throughout day and night and through the seasons. Um, and this, um, uh, we, uh, we recently lucked out on acquiring an island in um, Lake Tomogamy and uh, noticing maybe one... Uh, how the wind might be changing slightly and then an hour later this amazing evolving cumulus cloud that kind of um, parked itself and just continued to puff and move for the next two hours um, and sort of um, you know, consider um, why that might be happening and having a really strong recognition um, as to uh, the particular storm um, that might be following. Um, thinking about longer time frames, uh, geologic time frames, um, and what that allows us to read about landscape, um, uh, as well as uh, the sort of human practices um, that have been happening for century and how that has uh, evolved the landscape or co-evolved within the landscape um, in different ways. Um, I think particularly um, uh, of interest to me uh, now that I have um, two small kids, one of these is mine, the, the, the small one in the front, um, and how really important um, and engaged um, they become in the idea of natural processes. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with um, the complexities um, that um, nature is able to provide. Uh, and this is, I think, inherently something that we all register and we, we um, lose that ability to have a kind of an innate connection with that over time, um, particularly um, with, you know, 
uh, the ever-increasing number, whatever we're at now, 80, 90 percent of um, the Earth's population living in urban environments, where our urban environments um, often aren't that complex, or the complexity is separa separated out into individual components, um, where we may have some trees with some paving, with some other biological matter, but it's really, it's kind of a simple palette. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the idea would be how, um, how to kind of be able to bring that complexity back in a, in a productive way. Um, so this is where this book, Operative Landca Landscapes, com comes in. Um, it's been a, a, an obsession of mine, again, ever since I, I started studying in the discipline um, about how landscapes um, can really change over time, but how they can provide, um, uh, how they can be designed in a way where they can change over time. Um, and so really the idea here, um, the key word of um, operative, um, where uh, understanding this word and the definition that I'm using as sort of um, a verb about producing an appropriate or desired effect, uh, a functioning, having effect, being an effect, effective or efficacious, um, active in the production of effects, um, exerting force, power, or influence, engaged in, concerned with, or pertaining to work or productive activity, um, and functional and in working order. Um, so that idea of how that applies to landscapes um, would be the idea about how transformations um, of urban environments might happen over time, um, self-organization within uh, a framework, uh, future uncertainties that can be adaptable within a space, a constant process of unfolding, and design as it relates and reciprocates with public space. So that's the, the connection with the, with the landscape component. And I think this is um, a great diagram that, um, that is in the book um, um, by Paul Mboot, um, where basically they're demonstrating this idea where um, the discontinuous uh, diagram on the far left, where landscape is sort of an, uh, an afterthought um, as uh, just sort of, you know, uh, a beautification element or foregrounding in front of the building. But when um, in this particular um, project, the landscape was completely reconfigured um, to form a central spine, which then completely um, transformed uh, the engagement of the particular residents with their unit and as a community. Um, and then because there was this very focused landscape structure, the community then was able to imprint their ideas on that as a public open space and it's sort of a very iterative process. So that, in a way, the diagram and this project sort of nicely um, sums the ideas about the book. Um, so it's a, it's a case study-based book, so I'll take you through um, the chapters, and I have um, three projects. These are um, the chapter titles, um, which I in a way also follow the sequence of how projects are generally developed. Um, uh, and so it, it sort of... Um, pairs with that and also pairs with the case studies themselves becoming a little bit more complex and engaging more um, sort of more elements uh, throughout. So um, in the book, there's far more case studies, but um, for today, I'm going to cover three for each and then um, also one of our projects sort of to, to speak to how it influences um, uh, my own work in the office. So conceptualize is really the idea about projects with strong histories um, and narratives, um, how um, that sort of um, fabric might be repurposed and how you might be able to have new interpretations on that. Um, that there might be uh, a thinking of layers being traced and that forms a palimpsest, which then also allows sort of additional um, readings and the sites to accrue further meanings um, on, on, on the project as well. Uh, and then some projects that, you know, you might be familiar with that, you know, perhaps are indicative of this approach, um, which I should also say, Obviously, projects have a lot of different categorizations, but I think um, sometimes it's important to uh, theoretically group and frame projects so that we can have a new reading and a new understanding uh, of, of, of their benefits. Um, so uh, Crystal Park um, is uh, a project in Switzerland by um, Klotzli Friedli Landscape Architects. Um, and it was formerly a waste disposal site um, which prohibited um, built structure um, due to the sort of soil capacity. And the redevelopment objective of this project was to create an open space that would serve um, a wider community and all generations. So it already existed as a park space, but it was very um, sort of singular functional in its, in its program. Um, and so the design integrates existing elements um, to a large extent and adds layers of use and meaning to the site which accommodate the sort of growing and newer needs of the community. 
Um, and so proposing change to the existing public spaces can often be contentious, um, but the redesign in this particular case successfully adapts and increases park programs while meeting broad community approval. Um, so there are new insertions. Um, there's an old age home that was adjacent to it, uh, and by bringing the park right up to its edge, um, the, the program of that with children playing in the park mixed together really nicely. Um, so those types of elements, the fact that mature trees were um, you know, severely protected, which isn't always the case when we develop, and all those types of things allowed the sort of redevelopment um, to, to move a lot more smoothly. Um, New Suburbanism is a project um, that could be any bo big box store in North America, um, and it's by LTL Architects. Um, and it's a design proposal exploring the potential use of big box retail uh, stores as a platform for innovative community design strategies. So it emphasizes the importance of land reclamation uh, as the key strategy for reversing suburban sprawl, um, un uh, appropriating unproductive pieces of suburban land and converting the land into viable community housing in public space. Um, so it really looks at um, the idea of providing a strategic lens through which policymakers, um, planners, designers, and communities can begin to reconsider the environmental impacts of um, big box store enterprises. Um, and it demonstrates a need to rethink the approach um, taken by most suburban developments. Um, so, you know, it very much is an idea about um, single use land allocation. Um, so, it's, you know, initiating a dialogue that uh, attempts to create a new and more versatile uh, suburban communities. Uh, Serenby um, is a project in Georgia. Um, project lead by Reed Hildebrand as the landscape architects and um, Max Gogg and Merrill Lam architects. Um, and it was influenced by a public stewardship program that was advocating the preservation uh, of the farmland in the face of development pressures um, during Atlanta's housing boom um, of pretty much the past decade. Um, and it comprises the largest um, remaining undeveloped stretch of forested and agricultural lands in proximity to Atlanta. And so the particular strategy for this project was to save as much as 80% of existing land use um, projects um, and then also um, uh, uh, basically changed the, um, uh, the land use zoning um, so that any development would have to have a minimum of 200 acres um, to sort of do a complete uh, a development and that they must be, the development on that parcel must be kept within 30% of the land um, so that 70% could be saved for agricultural purposes. Um, and then things like circulation and water infrastructures were devised to be responsive to the hor historical farming patterns um, and the property's topographical and hydrological systems. So this is a water filtration plant that sort of um, nestles itself into the landscape and becomes um, a community uh, amenity as well. Um, and then community supported agriculture um, supplies the town's restaurants and shops and citizens uh, with produce. Um, and so uh, this idea of sort of a, m a minimal connection within the landscape um, that allows you to, um, allows you to uh, um, uh, appreciate the landscape in its existing condition, but still accommodate a sort of certain type of um, particular development. Um, so a field that, you know, can just be an open space um, also serves as an emergency airstrip landing or community gathering space. Um, and then uh, it, it does have a little bit more of a quaint architectural character, um, but uh, it allows sort of these types of um <laughs> uh, events, organic pies and such to, to be enjoyed. Um, so in relation to our work um, under sort of conceptualize, um, I chose this project, um, Core Sample, which was an installation at the Métis International Garden Festival. Um, and conceptually, it examined the history and process of systematic exploration to understand landscapes. Um, and it relayed this via the gridded structure um, of the cores, um, which were related to geologic exploration um, and the contextually related undulating topography as well. Um, so the core samples mark the inclination to measure and to organize the contents of a garden um, and celebrate these notions of uh, collection, sampling, and discovery. Um, there's also a correlation between very small sites and um, conceptually driven projects. Um, 
under plan. Um, here, the idea is projects with emphasis on an overall master plan, um, which becomes the referential uh, template for sites, um, design of multifaceted sites, um, and the idea that these incremental steps of site planning could foster a mutual trajectory within a community, um, and that landscape n uh, networks and open space matrix um, through the master plan technique can become identifiable as primary features. Um, and that um, with the master plan, you can um, quite easily encompass both concept and spatial layout as well. Um, so the community kind of building um, the power of the master plan as a kind of community consensus building is, you know, obviously a very sort of strong traditional tool. Um, so um, a lot of these types of projects that we know and use as precedents all the time um, for well-known communities, um, you know, historically down to um, uh, some, you know, more uh, contemporary projects um, sort of all really uh, capitalize on that technique. Um, this project, um, Messina Grand Moulin in the district in, in Paris, um, is Atelier Christian de Potsam Park. Um, and this project demonstrates how urban and public space can organize and promote dense urban form, um, thereby producing a socially vibrant community. Um, the open block forms the core of the concept and is structured by a gridded narrow street pattern which connects the district to the city. Um, all buildings have door fronts that open onto the street network to produce vibrant street life. Um, and then views and light and vegetation can penetrate the blocks. Um, although private public space are separated by um, walls or fencing, um, it's often quite transparent so that the continuity and readability of the public space um, allows that sort of um, the community to visually profit even if it's a, a, a private space um, or a private garden. Um, in the urban environment, the street is proven to um, be the simplest and most uh, open form, uh, able to adapt over time, so um, this office sort of really plays on that. Um, uh, also that it is, uh, allows um, it, uh, to incorporate unpredictable events, um, and so the open block uh, permits a considerable degree of architectural uh, and social mix. Um, so. Uh, Again, here sort of there are um, varieties of scales of landscape public spaces, but the idea that a kind of a very intentional um, architectural block would then sort of foster that dynamic and that, that social mix. Grenoble Kirschberg is in Luxembourg by Okra Landscape Architects. Um, and uh, while architects and landscape architects are, I think, increasingly working collaboratively, um, often it's still the plan where the landscape architect is sort of tasked to come up with a design um, after sort of the, the, the building layout um, has been done. Um, and so in this case, the master plan is sort of an application afterwards that then really attempts to weave together um, open spaces that were maybe much more um, architecturally derived. Um, and so uh, the challenge here was obviously for the landscape architect to sort of weave um, this um, in these spaces that um, lacked a kind of programmatic um, purpose or, or clarity. Um, and so to provide the community with a consistent identity, um, but still able to dif differentiate spaces, um, they use the idea of the urban orchard um, planted with apple and pear trees, which provides coherence through this, the theme of the edible city. Um, and then um, it, the urban orchard consists of many little orchards with each with its own atmosphere um, and everywhere um, passers-by are invited to pick the fruit. Um, so an, a network of circulation um, binds the uh, lines, bind the various public spaces in order to create a narrative um, and a spatial link between each of the public space fragments. Um, Zeri Town is a project in Dubai um, by X Architects. Um, and this is a climate responsive urban development. And unlike most projects in Dubai, um, which consider the site as a tabula rasa, Zeri Town takes the desert um, and local climate as the context for urban form to emerge, uh, working with the natural environment instead of against it. And so the influence of the landscape has resulted in urban massing that exhibits formal and functional dynamics similar to the dunes um, in the desert. 
And as an immediate reaction um, to the harsh desert sun, the urban footprint has been compressed to occupy 50% of the site, um, which then allows this sort of very compact, um, self-shaded structure, which is defined by narrow alleys and passageways um, and small squares, which then also assists with the air turbulence in natural ventilation and other passive cooling strategies. Um, so the landscape is formed by reuse of extra excavated soil um, to create topography um, and then components of recycled grey water for irrigation coupled with less evaporative subsoil irrigation systems and low maintenance air escapes which are also incorporated um, and also uh, irrigation free. Um, so the project basically searched for solutions that focused on both resource saving principles um, but also form, um, fostering an environment of social atmosphere in a pretty you know, harsh uh, environment. Um, so the fact that people could be outdoors um, and making interactions in public space um, becomes quite important. Um, so for the um, master plan strategy um, with our office, um, we worked on Gled Hill Public School. Um, it's located in the east end of the city and it's a really typical Toronto schoolyard which is lacking in shade or diversity of programs and educational opportunities. Um, and so we did a web-based survey which um, the intent was to reach a really wide um, range of students and teachers and parents um, which could build consensus on desired programs and elements. Um, and then the master plan fostered a mutual trajectory um, that basically exponentially increased the site's programmatic possibilities um, and also um, dynamics and overlaps as well. Um, where basically landscape could also foster uh, educational potentials while supporting the health of children um, and also environmental health as well. Um, so here getting into the sort of ideas of um, mutual benefits um, and just um, a little bit more programmatic complexity. <coughs> the idea with DEVELOP is projects that um, provoke um, private investment of their surrounds. Um, and so they're particularly concerned with remnant or derelict public spaces. Um, speculative land value really comes into play because it's sort of um, a, a really a significant portion of the strategy's allure. Um, and developers can also commit if the plan is resolved to a degree of conceivable detail. Um, and then the idea that you would also be able to account for um, a sort of a future demographic or inevitable change that the project has a degree of flexibility within it. Um, so, um, you know, Central Park has proven to do this over time. Um, you know, some of the, these key um, 1980s, early 90s parks in Paris. Um, parks Downsview Park is it was, was attempting maybe to use that strategy. Um, the High Line, I think, is probably the clearest example of that strategy. Um, and Brooklyn Bridge Park is also using um, that as a strategy as well. Um, so here to sor sort of show you more examples of that, um, Discovery Green um, in Houston, Texas by Hargraves Associates um, basically transforms what was a former surface parking lot um, located between a convention center, two major sporting venues and downtown commercial towers um, into a park that aims to unify the civic buildings and continues to uh, entice further development. Um, here there's a small diagram of that. Um, and so the park's success has prompted the dramatic and immediate transformation of the surrounding urban context um, and the broader perception and use patterns of downtown Houston as a whole. Um, housing markets, um, ho uh, sorry, hosting markets, public and private events, and a variety of play activities. Um, the park has also become one of the region's um, most important venues for public art. And through its connectivity um, and programming, it, it's really helped also dissolve social, economic, and racial strata to create a really true common ground. Um, and it's interesting on this one because the client group continues to do research on these kind of statistics on this site um, where they do visitor surveys, um, interviews, uh, the collection of zip codes to place really objective data on things that we kind of generally don't keep track of. Um, and so they can really um, figure out that interconnectivity between design intent, um, programming use, and then also economic sustainability. Um, so the use of Discovery Green by a broad spectrum of local residents and visitors combined with the park's ability to cover two-thirds of its required operational revenue through events and um, restaurant leases and donations is sort of um, uh, feeds into that idea of sort of keeping track of the park success. Um, and then with the complete gen regeneration of Houston's downtown, um, the park itself is um, already sort of paid off as, as, as an investment. Mm-hmm. <coughs> 
Um, this project, Sabana Grande in um, Caracas, Venezuela, was done by Enlas Arquitectura. Um, and uh, it was a boulevard that was um, severely um, deteriorated. Um, and so it was an opportunity to renew an entire um, uh, district by updating the public space components. Um, and so the boulevard um, was of vital import importance to the city um, as its most important pedestrian space, but um, left in this disrepair, um, retail area areas are liable to kind of continue to degrade and then it becomes a, a sort of disintegrating pattern. Um, and so this happened within the site, um, the poor economic conditions and um, lax public enforcement um, allowed appropriation by informal vendors and such, um, were just crime and corruption sort of then permeate the, the flavor um, of it. Um, so the design competition was launched with the intention to revitalize the streetscape and community. Um, and uh, the firm um, was granted the paving contract. It was really odd that each, like lighting, furniture, paving were completely different contracts. Um, but in a way, it's, it, it's kind of quite interesting that um, they took uh, the boulevard's already well-known um, concrete paver um, and then just by playing around with this overall application of gradual change in color and patterning and rhythm, um, that they're able to bring uniformity to the entire street network. Um, and so its renewed image has attracted new retail and then it's sort of an upcycle of all those events, uh, attracted additional visitors, more shopping, um, and so forth. And I think the project striking clarity, but sort of with reference to its historical references, um, demonstrates that um, well-designed public landscapes can renew desired cultural qualities. Um, and then uh, I guess the idea is that furthermore, it's, it's pretty impressive that this idea of the, the use of a single key element um, uh, you know, that uh, can, can really foster complete community transformation through just you know, this idea of a single paver. <coughs> um, Tokyo Midtown is uh, obviously in Japan um, and this project was done by AECOM uh, and this basically, uh, the project synthesizes the common experience of shopping um, known to um, uh, residents of Tokyo with the uncommon experience of, of open space recreation. So the idea of open space is um, not, not very common um, within the downtown area, but it does so in a manner that respects Japanese vernacular form, material, plant aesthetics, while also understanding the contemporary city. Uh, the site itself had a military legacy and that's what allowed this very large parcel of open space um, to be sort of um, cordoned off and not developed within the city. Um, so the developers took this as an opportunity um, uh, to play with the ratio of solid and void that you would typically find in Tokyo, um, which you know completely runs uh, contrary to convention. Um, and then with that bold gesture of allotting half the property as park space um, uh, then affords the developer grading building height, um, thereby simultaneously accomplishing both unconventional public space and very dense building form. Um, so it really alters the definition of urban renewal by placing greater emphasis on the role that landscape plays in shaping and shifting not only built form, but also the cultural um, behaviors of human interaction. And so it's a successful integration of the outmoded site into its context was premised on um, evolving uh, community behavior, which I think is really indicative in this slide because to um, lie back in a public space in Japan is really um, unheard of. Uh, so that idea that a new project would be able to evolve a cultural behavior, I think is quite powerful. Um, <coughs> our work here, um, is uh, this is a first place winning entry in the um, Bridging Prague competition, which envisions a strengthened park um, and green space network uh, in and around the city. Um, and it capitalizes on the underused sites uh, found uh, adjacent to the uh, Vladova River um, and really tries to um, make the river as kind of the central linking strategy. Um, so the proposal positions the river as the catalyst for park enhancement and renewal, which is um, then projected to induce private investment as park supports and, and contextual uh, stewardship input. 
Um, so the park as a contiguous system uh, accounts for long-term change as well as being able adaptable to occasional flooding. Um, so um, again, kind of demonstrating sort of the layering of purpose uh, and program to bring uh, complexity and diversity to a site. <coughs> Construct uh, is the idea of um, more um, uh, technological innovations or remediation strategies, um, maybe s as a starting point operating from um, convention and precedent, but then really developing new ideas through creative uh, creativity and innovative techniques and developments of new materials. Um, site challenges um, in this particular, at this sort of construction <laughs> phase, often result in original and inventive solutions, um, and remediation is an influencing factor and positive reminder of a transformation uh, process. Um, so uh, a lot of these projects are uh, much more contemporary. Um, uh, particularly Duisburg Nord, um, Western Gas Fabrique, we really know as sort of key remediation projects. Um, Sydney Olympics also dealt with a lot of remediation strategies, um, Fresh Kills, uh, Olympic Sculpture um, Park, and um, even our own Toronto Central Waterfront has had to um, do a lot of creative construction um, in regards to some of those issues. Um, <coughs> Belleville West is in Luxembourg um, by Bureau Lubbers. Um, and it was a former iron and steel production site which actively engaged in the site's industrial landscape to promote a strategy premised upon the reuse of its structural and natural succession um, vegetative features. Um, and so critical to the project's objective of recalibrating the site and careful articulation of its phasing strategy um, uh, to encourage density while preserving the core of the site's vegetative character, the master plan prioritizes the implementation of public space and infrastructure which uses these open areas to strategically guide built form um, and phase its development. Um, so the idea is that design interventions are a minimal because it's such a long-term project that they're minimal during um, uh, low development times which just allows for natural succession to open happen in the landscape um, uh, spaces. Um, and then during times of intense urban development that public space is has sort of been um, used as a placeholder, which then allows um, current community requirements to imprint on that particular um, landscape associated with that particular phase of development. Um, so there's sort of temporary um, sort of characteristics, um, but that overall there's this sort of phasing strategy with an intentional um, uh, mixing um, of uh, programs and housing units and cultural facilities that um, helps further remediate and develop the site um, and that it sort of develops a rich um, uh, palette of materials and a, a kind of registering of incremental growth. Green Square Town Centre um, is uh, a project in Sydney, Australia, done by McGregor Coxall, um, and it's a large-scale economic and environmental restoration project, um, which comprised an amalgamation of um, several contaminated industrial lands. Um, and the kind of key central aspect of this is um, uh, redeveloping or rethinking um, uh, a hydrological uh, landscape-based infrastructure system. Um, that basically replaces uh, what used to be stormwater flowing through a pipe. Um, so the green engineering mechanisms, um, biofiltration um, for non-potable water uses, um, end up providing 90% of the water needs for the entire project, um, including all the residential and commercial uses as well. Um, so the idea that water forms a resilient and functional urban ecological network that really sort of drives um, a lot of the project development and then the landscape plays a vital role in generating community activity, promoting community cohesion and environmental stewardship. Um, so the project really exemplifies that reintegration of ecological systems is not only possible in the urban context, but that resilient design of ecologically grounded public space can actually serve as the central motivation for urban renewal. Um, this project is particularly satisfying because it's a former student that was lead on this project um, at uh, SWA Group. Um, and so uh, it's nice to see that there's opportunity to actually um, implement theory. Um, so this Nanhu site is currently a tapestry of small farms and canals in the Yangtze Delta. And with the completion of the high-speed rail to Shanghai, the new community is designed as an alternative to the um, prevailing um, intense urbanity 
um, really by retaining um, farmland and the historical cultural significance of this farmland. Um, so it deals with issues of polluted and degraded environmental uh, conditions by maintaining and treating its extensive canal network um, and rethinking farming practices and economies of scale and also repositioning the community as an agricultural center of organic food production um, for the surrounding mega cities. So um, really sort of rethinking how um, traditional uses can come into play, but updated into sort of contemporary desires and needs. Um, so retaining these traditions, um, family farms, uh, uh, while also introducing larger production areas, as well as sort of um, 100 hectare organic farms. Um, so the agricultural history is maintained through production of organic herbs and um, fruits and rice and flowers, um, while new farming technologies um, allow sort of farmlands to increase in quality and productive value. Um, so as farmland is quickly eaten up for urban growth, Nanhu provides a model to inform housing options, um, while at the same time increasing the productivity of the land and improving environmental quality. Um, <coughs> our project here, looking at sort of um, uh, technologies and incorporating those types of technologies was um, a, a temporary run, it was about two, three year installation project um, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and uh, these forms uh, were designed to refer to Cleveland's relationship to industry, craftsmanship, and innovation. Um, and they represent the use of new technologies and materials, thereby suggesting possibility. Um, the form-fitting fabric um, uh, came and went with the seasons um, that talks about to the relation of uh, biological renewal and decay um, and were internally lit at night powered by flexible solar panels woven into the fabric. Um, the project introduced more than uh, 4,000 square feet of native Ohio grasses into the core of downtown um, and then ever-changing in appearance um, and uh, kind of also in support of uh, urban wildlife, which um, was supported by the grasses. Um, so the herd of pods not only transformed material possibilities, um, but also uh, the use of the space by enticing evening use, um, which was typically really um, vacant and uh, within the downtown uh, core of Cleveland. So this last section um, of Evolve um, is it kind of really gets to um, the heart of the intention of the book and, and what it's really looking at. Um, and so they're really projects that prompt um, renewal um, and continual improvement in kind of a, an iterative way. Um, they look at landscape as infrastructural framework to accommodate flexibility um, and landscape architect crafts the logic that helps um, or sets the framework that helps um, evolve the community. Um, Process-based design anticipates change similar to a resilient ecosystem and cultural legibility and knowledge provoking landscape um, is paramount. Um, so some examples um, of some of these projects um, that um, again, kind of more in the realm, uh, well, the Amsterdam Bos is quite old, but the rest are quite uh, contemporary examples. Um, so here in Canada, um, Dockside Green, um, done by PWL Partnership, um, is an adaptive reuse uh, of an industrial site, blending the industrial fabric with innovative practices in landscape technology. And the site strategies for development also form important identity for the community, which supports the maturation of the community, which in turn then um, further attracts uh, desired additional programs and activities. Um, a lot of it had to do with closed loop, loop strategies of um, wastewater um, and uh, biomass and central heating systems and alternative transportation strategies. Um, and small businesses are really encouraged to provide local goods and the development aims to be accessible to a diverse mix of people. Um, wildlife habitats and green spaces are really integrated through green roofs or green walls um, that are traversed by walking trails and wetlands and waterways that function to collect, filter and recycle rainwater and grey water. Um, so the outdoor areas of the grade level, um, oops, I'm on to the next project. Um, uh, <coughs> So the outdoor areas um, of the grade level residential units cantilever over the freshwater demonstration wetland, providing the physical um, connection to the water and yet allows the sort of public and private space to remain quite um, distinct. Um, and so in general, the idea that the community would sort of really foster um, thoughtful 
uh, water use um, consumption, um, that uh, you know, public transport or cycling or walking is made so much easier than getting to your car, um, and that the, the nature of the shops that will only continue to grow and produce um, uh, local goods um, just continues to um, iteratively um, close the material loop. Um, and the fact that it has this sort of very strong identity-based community that, you know, you move here because you want to participate in that um, also allows the site to further evolve toward its desired goals. <coughs> Um, Eco Bay is a project in Tallinn, Estonia that was done by Schmidt Hammer Lawson Architects um, and it's adjacent to a nature reserve so it's envisioned as a new independent mixed-use district um, and with green strategies for infrastructure infrastructure development, um, the de designer's intent is to provide a uh, multifunctional structure for a diverse and vibrant community intended to develop an organic self-organizing capacity. Um, instead of adopting a rigid grid, this st scheme introduces a system of dunes spreading across the site to significantly reduce wind speeds um, along the exposed coastal edge. And the public space system seamlessly integrates the variety of districts uh, in um, and minimizes the need for transportation, public amenities located within walking distance from all homes, um, and the public landscape is combined with biodiversity corridors that connect the site's green areas and existing nature reserve to establish a new uh, ecosystem. Um, reed beds uh, filter water and uh, clean gray water, which again irrigate all public landscapes, and the relationship of architecture and landscape sets the framework for the site to continually develop its own organization as a city left to grow of its own accord. <coughs> Um, as the final case study project here, this is in the Netherlands, um, done by Bureau Lovers, and it's actually one of the oldest projects in the book, um, but I think sort of really encompasses this idea um, uh, uh, of allowing um, uh, the kind of landscape to, to form the backbone of the community. Um, so it's the community project um, that's capitalized on landscape to enhance the community's infrastructural performance capabilities. Um, and it's really inspired by the visual opportunities that are afforded by the surrounding forest um, area uh, and the canopy. And so the design team arranged the housing units um, to create um, a spatial effect where the houses are sort of sitting within um, the tree canopies and forming these um, outdoor rooms. So the dense planting strategy allows the houses to feel like they're really nestled within that topography and within their location, um, which is, um, you know, makes everything sort of feel sighted. Um, but then there's this additional layer of uh, rainwater collection um, system that serves the purpose of collecting, containing, and recycling uh, rainwater in ponds that vary in design. And, uh, you know, a lot of projects have been using this technique and gray water and filtering and so forth. But I think what's so interesting about this project is that it really allows you to see it because it's funneling through the curves the way the street's been designed. Um, you can um, search this project on YouTube and see some pretty incredible rainstorm events happening. Um, and so the fact that the, the operation of something so simple as drainage is made so visually um, recognized within the project, um, I think really is its strength. And so the project is based on a spatial planning strategy that shares a close interaction um, with natural features made further evident through the use of landscape as infrastructure. Um, so just as a final uh, example on, again, the, all of these ideas and influences in our own work um, was our forest proposal for um, in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, and this was a competition this past summer. Um, and we were shortlisted as finalists in the Tribute to Liberty Memorial as a testament to all Canadians that have found freedom in Canada and refuge from um, communist tyranny. Definitely a topic not without um, controversy, <laughs> um, but uh, our office's proposal um, drew on the forest as formal inspiration and meaningful uh, metaphor. So for us, the forest represents the ideas of protection, growth, renewal, and co-evolution. And as a metaphor, we're um, 
uh, making that connection that forests are actually highly democratic in the way they um, uh, figure their relationships um, and, and so forth. Um, so the idea of persistence and hope um, are represented through the incredible qualities um, of forest light and the monumental forms of oak struggle persistence um, and ultimately autonomy. So clearings in the forest um, allow you know, wildflowers and other um, opportunistic vegetation to grow um, that can change over time, but ultimately overall the site evolves um, daily and annually um, with the uh, commemorative events as well, um, with the forest as a reminder uh, of resiliency. Um, so, as a sort of, uh, a, you know, a sort of practical summary, um, the idea that operative landscapes would have um, influence from past site use, um, landscape as infrastructure um, is, you know, very predominant and a big topic in, in general in landscape architecture. Um, the idea that there would be educational opportunities tied in with these projects, um, government and regulatory support tends to be um, pretty much um, necessary for all projects. Um, energy technology, recycling, um, walkability becomes really huge. Um, the idea that they're programmed yet flexible um, and then certainly um, thoughtfully designed, um, which is um, all of our role. Um, but I guess I sort of think, you know, ultimately, um, uh, when, when you're reviewing these, it's sort of easy to classify projects into categories um, and you sort of think, well, in the end, why does it matter? Um, there's still, you know, individual projects that are all, you know, trying their best to sort of make a difference in the world with um, the best technologies, you know, coupled with um, standards that we've known in design for a really long time. Um, but just going back to um, uh, Anne's comment about um, the language of landscape is that I, I really feel that um, the way we need to build in our cities is not only just being able to understand the landscape, but actually that our designs now start to participate in that language. Um, and I think if you think about um, how, you know, in our last project, the forest has an ability and the way forests function is that there's actually a lot of communication going on within that system that allows things to move in or move on or um, have resiliency through disease because of the way the elements communicate together. Um, and I think really it's less that we've forgotten how to read the landscape, but we've forgotten how to be a participant within that network of communication. Um, and I really do think that, um, you know, things like the webs we've created on the internet and ideas of knowledge sharing give a lot of clues in terms of how we can um, make our urban environments very complex and, and function um, in really um, interesting and, and productive ways. Um, so. To me, I think that's why it's important. Um, are we there yet? No, but I really think that it's a direction that we're moving in. And so I think that idea that um, landscape architecture can foster that kind of complexity within the landscape, um, uh, in the urban landscape in particular, is, is really exciting and really powerful. Um, so that's kind of a summary of the book and how it's uh, influenced kind of um, my thinking on design. Um, I hope I d didn't take too long. I don't know if there's time for questions, but um, I'd be happy to answer them. Oops. Mm -hmm. um, Sabana Grande, yeah. Right. yeah. Right, right. Um, I actually, I actually spoke to um, her. Her name is Elisa. I actually, sp I actually spoke to her about that, and now I'm forgetting if they made the decision to use it so that it would have recognition, or if they were mandated because it was a, a, a city use pattern. Um, but it, it was, um, it was somewhere within that option. Um, but the fact that she just m made the most of it, I think, was was pretty incredible because it really is that. It's got to be the most classic um, paver shape uh, globally. Um, so um, I, I could follow up with her and ask again <laughs> which option it was. Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't think that I don't I don't think they did, but uh, but that would have been a nice layer. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, um, Oxford uh, Casino, I believe it was, they said that if they were ever to bring um, a casino into the downtown core, they would actually um, bring landscape and they would make it a public space. They would make it into like a, a place where people during the summertime could watch movies. They would want the people to be integrated into more of an outdoor um, lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. Which I think down in the future it will happen because there are projects that are suggesting connecting like um, the, the, the terminal project for the go bus that mm-hmm. will link a part and they, they're offering a small um, kind of bridge that would be uh, landscaped as well. Right, right. Um, and then also the new redevelopment for the new station is uh, I think they're going to be putting on like green roofs. Mm-hmm. Only for Uh, you're, you've got a lot of your question, um, but but I, I think that I think the essence of it is that um, I guess I guess I for me it always uh, seems to be a point of criticality, um, and so it, it gets to a point where we can no longer uh, provide a solution that doesn't have a green roof um, because it's you know proven itself to be effective in reduce heat island effect and it has other benefits in terms of encouraging development and so on and so forth. So I think those ideas that. Um, uh, we need to figure out how to design in a way where, m- you know, multiple objectives are being met, but multiple objectives are also being suggested to start off in the first place. Um, I-, I think there's a lot of productivity in that. Um, uh, how to get through, you know, red tape of, you know, um, single vision counselors. That that is a whole different. <laughs> that's a whole different topic. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. <coughs> and so that's what I think part of these projects are really trying to look at as well is to find out when those um, proposals start to become mutually beneficial so that it's not saying, well, you know, you have to cover the cost of the green roof and it's a loss to you, but we're just going to set it in as policy. Um, like we need to get to a point where we're designing and we're thinking and we're proposing in ways where the the benefit is mutual. So it's not like a required condition, but that it's actually, you know, uh, functional all around. So I think that's where we're just not necessarily um, smart enough in our communications to find what those efficiencies are just yet. Um, but uh, I li- it, like it's it's gonna come. You see you see cities like Philadelphia, and they they've decided to pull away from, you know, single use uh, engineering structures to deal with all their urban stormwater runoff, and they're implementing a myriad of possibilities of green infrastructures because the the cost of digging deeper, bigger, further, more concrete is just not viable anymore. Um, and so that's where that idea of a kind of a critical point coupled with benefit for all is is really I think where where things are going to happen and they need to happen. Hmm? Let me ask about the other end of the project now. <coughs> um, what level of well, I guess sustainability, maintenance, etc. really does have to be considered so that in fact once the project is cutting through red tape and exists, etc. 
Right, right. And so um, for me, I, I have this really idealistic vision that talks to the last chapter of this book of Evolve. 